when was the last time I saw you though? So yeah, it was. <laughs> That was a that was a tough that was a tough day busy day. So I, I think we're uh, I think we're live now, um, and so I just want to thank everybody for for joining this call. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to take a lot of time up, but I, I think in uh, it's appropriate. We've seen in uh, this moment of of crisis, uh, both. Uh, uh, from a, a social justice crisis to the pandemic that we're facing, uh, that uh, we have uh, here in South Carolina, what I would like to say is is the the country's mayor, and uh, Steve Benjamin. He's his leadership has been in, inspirational, much needed. Uh, you know, one would argue uh, that uh, we would be greatly served if, if he was uh, in a different role here in South Carolina, but I'm going to leave that for another day. Uh, but without further ado, my my dear friend, uh, Steve Benjamin, Mayor Benjamin. Hey, Jay, it's it's a, it's a real pleasure uh, to join you and, and Pete and the whole team here uh, today. Uh, you've been an amazing inspiration to so many uh, for, for so long uh, over the last uh, several years. We obviously have been friends for, for longer than the two years that you've been serving in the, in the General Assembly. Uh, for folks who are just meeting you or have been inspired by me or Pete, others reaching out on your behalf, uh, you represent obviously Berkeley and Charleston counties in the House of Representatives, the first chef uh, elected to the General Assembly, uh, maybe in its history. Uh, why I think that stands out? Because it, it, you bring the creativity and the passion uh, of a chef to that, that place every single day where 170 men and women um, hopefully on the best days, aspire to, to help us live up to our, our, our model while I breathe, uh, I, I hope. Uh, but the work that you do helping on, on issues like improving health in schools, uh, um, uh, fighting for education and nutrition, uh, ending gun violence. I mean, you've been, a, you've been an inspiration, brother. And I, I will tell you that when, when, I, when you first told me uh, that, you, that you wanted to run, that you were on a run, I was like, okay, this, this, is, this, is, uh, this is interesting. You have been nothing short of amazing as a policymaker. And I hope and pray that not only will the people uh, in, in, in the district uh, send you back, uh, but they'll continue to send you back and help move you on to whatever it is your, your God has uh, in store for you. Uh, uh, obviously, you're a small businessman, so you understand uh, sign the front and the back of a paycheck, which makes a whole lot of sense. And, and, and obviously, I know your, your greatest passion is that you're a child of God, a husband. And, and, a, and a father, so you know we're building South Carolina for generations uh, growing up here and, and, and yet to come. Uh, in times like these in which we are indeed uh, in a few months in 2020, reliving 1918, 1932, and 1968 all wrapped up into one, uh, South Carolina needs the leaders. And, and that's why I didn't hesitate uh, to dig deep uh, and to um, uh, contribute uh, towards your reelection and reached out to my friends and asked them to do the same. For folks who are kind enough to join us today, if, you, if you've given once already, I want to ask you to give again. Uh, they can, can continue to give. Uh, the, the incredible mayor that, that um, uh, Jay is going to introduce in a, in a, in a moment uh, is, is, is one of the few who, who was able to show exactly what people power means uh, in American politics today. The days of, 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 the, of the rich and powerful only uh, contributing and controlling elections are long over. Uh, the ability for each and every one of us to give in amounts that, 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 that we can uh, and support the men and women we want to help uh, build uh, this country as a, as a constant architect, building a more perfect union. Uh, those days are here and now. Uh, Pete has exemplified that, uh, but I will tell you, if you haven't had a chance to keep your eye on J.A. more, I want to encourage you to do that. We have a long, a long joke in politics. Pete's been around almost as long as I have. Uh, people who have deep pockets and short arms. Uh, we want, want to dig deep, dig dig deep, and give what you can uh, to support Jay more uh, in this effort. Uh, I've given once, and, and Jay, I'm going I'm to show up. I'm going to give again. I'm going to max out uh, to your campaign over the course of, of, of this election. We need to keep you exactly where you are. South Carolina needs you. I need you. Our family needs you. And our families all across the state need you. Uh, so y'all, please give uh, and continue to give. Uh, to our friend Jay Moore. Um, Steve, I just want to thank you again, um, just for just for your kind words, uh, and and more importantly, uh, just for your continuous leadership. Um, you know, I've known it for a long time, 
and uh, and so has so many people. But during once again, I just can't iterate how much it has meant for the entire state. Your leadership doing a time when we need a leader so badly here in South Carolina. Uh, and, and then to, and to that point, it's, uh, it's with this great humility that I introduce um, someone who I consider a friend, uh, someone who I can consider uh, the uh, new generation of leadership that we need in this country. Uh, a person who, uh, who Steve called me uh, early, I think it was last year, and said, "Is this mayor that I want you to meet?" Uh, and uh, and he said his name was Buttigieg, and I don't know if I could say it correctly uh, at the time, uh, but but I but I but I went with what I you know how I could say it, and I remember our first call. Um, um, uh, Pete called me up, and and. What I recognized early on, the people of South Bend, where he served uh, two terms as mayor, knew was that he listened. I mean, his his ability to like listen. I, I'm not. I, I don't know any way. It's, it's as simple as that. It's like his ability to listen clearly, precisely, uh, and with intentions was powerful. Um, and uh, throughout the uh, the course of the presidential campaign, uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg proved that a, a mayor from uh, South Bend, Indiana, uh, could show the entire country, if not the world, that uh, who you love uh, is one part of you, uh, but the love for country is is so powerful. And Pete inspired all of us. I was uh, encouraged by being able to endorse his campaign and, and, and walk with him. Uh, he's a rogue scholar, uh, but he breaks things down really plainly for all of us uh, to understand. And um, I did, I'm, you know, he calls me at least once a month, we talk. And, and then and normally don't be about anything. I'm all excited when he calls and he's like, I'm just checking in. And that just speaks to the volume of this leadership and values that this this brother has. So I uh, I'm just honored to consider him a friend, and just can't wait to to change the world with him. Uh, so it's without further ado, I introduce my dear friend, uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Thanks so much, Jay. I'm uh, uh, so proud to be in your corner, and uh, it's so great to be reunited. I miss our days on the ground campaigning together, but uh, this is the next best thing to do it uh, by Zoom. And I'm so glad to be with Mayor Benjamin too. He is, uh, uh, I hope folks on, on this call know that, that uh, he is recognized among mayors around the country as a mayor's mayor. That's why we asked him to be the president of our conference of mayors. Uh, it was a, a, a pleasure to work with him in that capacity. And we continue to work together as he's uh, also uh, a leader of an effort to make sure that mayors across the country are linking in with uh, experts on confronting the pandemic. He's been a leading voice on uh, uh, the search for racial justice in, in this country and, and somebody that uh, it's just always a treat to be able to uh, team up. So, so glad to be with you. I just want to say a few words about why I think it's so important to support uh, J.A. and why I'm thankful for everybody on this call who's joined us, including a number of people who I know have been uh, on quite a few calls with me lately with the Win the Era community and the endorsed candidates that we're backing. And I wanna thank you for taking time out and uh, for, for being generous with your treasure too, uh, to make sure that, uh, that we do right uh, by J.A. and support his leadership. And some of the criteria that, that we went through as we were deciding knowing that we could only back it, handful of candidates around the country, but we wanted to uh, make sure that that range of candidates we backed sent a message. There were a few things that I thought were a very important message to send in this race. The first is that we do have a new generation of leadership uh, rising in our party uh, and often in the so-called red states, and uh, J.A. Uh, represents that. He is somebody who comes to this process with a view to the future and making sure that that future is better for those he loves and those he serves. Another thing that's a, a principle that was such a big part of our presidential campaign, such a big part of Win the Era, uh, I think it, it's something every mayor thinks about when they think about uh, uh, what politics is for, 
is that this is all about everyday life. This is about our lived experiences. And uh, as a representative, uh, J.A. Moore has taken uh, his lived experiences, uh, his experiences uh, with business leadership, uh, and his experiences with tragedy, with loss, and has made sure that those experiences have a voice in a chamber where so many critically important decisions are made. It strikes me that we're living in a moment where, on one hand, it's never mattered more who's in these offices, like state representative offices, a long way from the White House. We're seeing just how much it matters who's in charge of your state, who's in charge of your city. But on the other hand, the problem is because of all of these world-shaking events that are commanding our attention, there's less attention and less oxygen politically, and sometimes that means less money available to go into those races at just the moment when we're seeing how much they matter. And that's where we have a chance to do something about that. And so uh, uh, this race really represents, I think, the work that we need to do to uh, build up uh, our caucuses uh, and where we can our majorities in the state legislatures uh, around the country to do so much important work. Uh, J.A. Moore's focus from right away on things like mental health in schools reflects the fact that he listens to the constituents that he serves. I saw it every time we were out campaigning together, the town halls that we did together, the events uh, where we were out on the trail. And mental health is a good example of one of those issues that you wouldn't know uh, following the, the press necessarily, uh, how, uh, how big it is for the people we serve. But if you listen to the people uh, that we serve, it is always at or near the top of the list. Uh, so just one example of the kind of leadership that uh, is gonna benefit not just South Carolina, uh, but again, I think is, is a benefit to our entire party and movement. Uh, and I know that we're going to be continuing to, to see a lot from Jay and his style of leadership in years to come. So uh, that's why I'm excited to, to and proud to be in your corner. It's why I'm asking everybody here to go out and tell a friend. Uh, if you're uh, a part of the 15th district or part of South Carolina, you know how important this is. If you're joining us from around the country, uh, help educate uh, uh, our friends around the country on why they ought to pay attention to this South Carolina race. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll toss it uh, back to you, uh, J.A., and looking forward to our conversation. Uh, Pete, once again, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take a, a, a personal privilege and, and just mention, I, uh, uh, someone shared an article with me today, well, it was a couple of days ago, and it was from an alumni from Notre Dame from the <laughs> class of 1969. And in an article, it talked about how uh, this young group of uh, students at Notre Dame came to Hampton, South Carolina in 1968 uh, on the request of, of my, my father, James Moore. Um, and uh, he was 38 years old. And what's serendipitous about that, uh, Pete, is uh, you ran for president at 38 years old and you're from South Bend where Notre Dame is. And so, I just think it was just a powerful moment that uh, that story was shared with me uh, so recently. And, uh, and, and I think it speaks to a bigger uh, question that, that, that's on a lot of people's mind now. Um, like what are your, and we'll get into some of the questions that we, we, uh, we have, but what are your thoughts about like our current political climate? <clears throat> uh, well, thanks, that's uh, uh, wonderful to hear about that connection through to, to South Bend and Notre Dame. Um, so the way, <coughs> excuse me, the way it looks to me now is that on one hand, there's, there's a real tailwind uh, in America, uh, wind at our backs in the change that we're trying to make. Whether it's the outpouring of anguish across the country after the murder of George Floyd that uh, brought so many people to a reckoning uh, with the racial injustice in this country. And I think one of the reasons why we can hope that this time really will be different, is a multiracial nature to, to the coalition that has formed. And an awakening, uh, I think, among a lot of white progressives, frankly, that, that fighting racism is not just about uh, uh, the KKK and the, and the avowedly white nationalists. It's about everybody questioning how the structures and the systems that we're all part of need to change. Uh, so we see that, that that's happening. We see when it comes to the pandemic in the worst way, why this uh, change can't come soon enough, why our president is letting us down and his protectors in Congress uh, are putting lies at risk. All of this means we have a historic opportunity to get support. 
It's putting different parts of the map in play like they haven't been in my lifetime. What I think we've got to remember and be on guard against are two things. <clears throat> First of all, the mechanics of the elections themselves. It is not going to be easy to run an election in a pandemic. We're already seeing, on top of the kind of voter suppression that was already such a concern, especially in the South, uh, and especially when directed uh, to suppress the, the Black and, and, and Brown voices of voters. But on top of that, now we have a lack of poll workers. We have a lack of polling locations. We've got to make sure and that everybody has a chance to safely vote from home. And even as we push for vote by mail to be universal, we gotta make sure there are safe in-person means of voting uh, for those who can't have access to that vote by mail. So there's a lot of work to do on that. The other thing that worries me is that uh, more blows are going to come between now and November. These kinds of world historical shocks, they don't usually come just in ones and twos. And I think there are gonna be more surprises. You know, in the last four months, we've seen just how much the world can change in a four month period. Well, there's four more months between now and the election. And that means that just because polls are looking good or uh, indications are encouraging, that doesn't mean we can let up one minute. If though we maintain this energy and if we prepare for what's ahead, I think this could be the beginning of a moment that, that changes in a very positive way, changes our future. I think that 2020 was already shaping up to be one of those years that shapes the decade to come. I think the shape of this decade is gonna decide the way our country unfolds for as long as you and I are alive. The way we climb out of this economic and public health disaster, the way we respond to the, emer the moral emergency of racial justice, these decisions that we're about to make, they're going to set up our lives for years and decades to come. That's one of the reasons it's so important that we get this right now, and that begins with a good election result. So I am hopeful, and that's one of the reasons why we're working so hard with Win the Air to support great candidates like you and the work that you're doing, but also mindful that this is not a time to get comfortable just because we see more and more people coming to our side. Uh, all of us together are gonna have to run through that finish line. Thank you so much uh, for that thoughtful response. <laughs> and just a real quick uh, 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 note for folks, uh, those that have questions, there's a question box that you can type your questions in or you can raise your hand on Zoom and, and uh, we'll get to that. Uh, uh, Pete, let's talk a little bit more about uh, uh, elections. You um, you talked about it very uh, frequently in, in in some great depth about the electoral college, and you know I think after 2016 we were all looking at ourselves like uh, Dave Chappelle did uh, 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 SNL. You know his. his <laughs> You know his uh, SNL uh, that whole after the election, which is was was priceless. But talk to us a little bit about electoral colleges and, and some of your thoughts on, on time where we have got to undertake major democratic reforms to make our democracy more democratic. And part of that is that uh, the the person who gets the most support from the American people ought to be president. I remember thinking as a high school student learning about the electoral college. I remember thinking, well. It sounds strange, but if it ever, you know, if it ever actually happened that the Electoral College overruled the American people, if, if an American majority ever picked one president and the Electoral College picked another, that would be the end of the Electoral College. What's well, actually happened twice since I was in high school. And this is really calling the question on whether America is the democratic country that we uh, think of ourselves as being. Most Americans think that we ought to make this change and there's a way to do it. I, I believe ultimately this requires a constitutional amendment, but we don't have to wait for that process in order for that to happen. There's a, a process of states agreeing to what's called an interstate compact that each of them will direct their electors to support the winner of the popular vote and just if just a few more states come on board. And these decisions, by the way, are made by state legislators like you and governors. If just a few more states came on board, we would in fact have a national uh, emerge on earth in 2000 years would actually become more of a true democracy in the best sense. So this is one, one example of the kinds of things that are at stake that sound far off and impossible, but can actually be achieved uh, in short order. And by the way, when that happened, uh, I think that it would uh, change the way that uh, if you are a, a Democrat in a very red state, or for that matter, a conservative in a very blue state, uh, you would be heard in a different and, and better way 
than what happens right now. So, uh, look, I think there's no such thing as a permanently red state. I think South Carolina is going to uh, show that. Uh, another candidate we're excited to be backing this year is Jamie Harrison, who I think is going to prove that in the Senate. And I know we're all uh, working toward that goal. Uh, but the bottom line is we shouldn't be carved up into red states and blue states. This is one country with one fate, and we should have one election uh, when it comes to the general election to decide who our next president is going to be. Can you talk about, you mentioned our <laughs> dear friend, Jamie. Can you talk about how, number one, how important it is for South Carolina to start shifting uh But also talk specifically about uh, the uh, the importance of uh, Jamie's race. You know, I, I want to yield some time to Jamie because I think it's important, and and how that uh, will help down ballot uh, other down ballot races like mines and, and and other folks like Ed Sutton, for example. I can't hear. Can you hear? Sorry about that. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, All right. So I come at this as somebody who lives in Indiana, one of the most conservative states in the country. And yet I saw this state turn blue for Barack Obama for the first time in a half century when he ran for president. Our state has produced the likes of Mike Pence and Dan Quayle. It's also produced people like Birch Bayh, who a generation ago was authoring uh, things like the Equal Rights Amendment. That, uh, uh, that should have passed and, and other amendments that did pass. Uh, so uh, things can change. And I actually think it's in the heartland and in the South that we have a chance to build a new progressive tradition where we know just how much the interests of people, you look at something like Medicaid expansion, how, how much the interests in the majority can be stitched together in the kind of uh, multiracial coalition, the kind of fusion politics that uh, Reverend Barber, just north of you in uh, Goldsboro, North Carolina, speaks of so often, uh, between uh, uh, people who have shared interests. And I think that makes anything possible. Uh, so does the fact that Lindsey Graham has sacrificed whatever respect he might have earned on either side of the aisle from being outspoken about what a moral disaster the Trump presidency would be, uh, to eating his own words and, and uh, falling all over himself, almost literally, uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, cover for the president, uh, as well as ingratiate himself toward him in mean, a spectacle that I think is a hard, frankly, as a person, it's just hard to watch another person do that to their own dignity. And uh, of course, when he does that, he's hurting not only the dignity of, uh, of his own career, but, but that of the state that he represents. This creates a, a remarkable moment for Jamie Harrison, whose personal story uh, of uh, uh, growing up poor in Orangeburg, uh, and uh, uh, earning a, a chance to work with Whip Clyburn uh, and then uh, uh, be, being one of the first uh, ever uh, Black Chiefs of Staff on Capitol Hill, uh, becoming such an effective uh, party chair. I, I got to know him, and this is a testimony that uh, I think his character, when you can uh, become friends with somebody and, and come to like them, uh, not the way you and I became friends when we were uh, uh, on, on the same side and working together, but actually when Jamie and I were competing against each other. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, both seeking the DNC chairmanship. And I came away just uh, so admiring of his talent uh, and, and his heart for what is right for, for the people that he served. Uh, so uh, this is a marquee race. Maybe a couple months ago, folks wouldn't have thought so, but if you look at the numbers now, it is absolutely within our grasp. And not only would it be an extraordinary benefit to the country to, uh, uh, to win back the Senate for the party, but I think in particular, this race that you all uh, are part of in South Carolina, it's the kind of win that would send a shockwave through the party, the, the Republican Party, that, that might be what we need for them to start getting in touch with their own conscience. Uh, I, I don't need them to come to agree with us on everything, but I need them to turn into more of a good faith organization than they are. I think we all do. And something like Lindsey Graham losing his seat because he tried to ride this tiger uh, when he knew better uh, of the Trump campaign, what a powerful message that would send in addition to getting a great public servant like Jamie Harrison serving you. Uh, and as you said, this is also a matter of political mobilization. <clears throat> because people around the country are watching this race, I think we have a chance uh, for the races that could expand your caucus uh, in the House uh, to move in the right direction to help, help you, to uh, help everybody who's stepping forward to uh, make sure that we, we prove in South Carolina that a different kind of politics can happen. It's all around you, uh, Georgia, North Carolina, uh, on either side of you are are really uh, turning heads right now when it comes mm -hmm. to the numbers. What an amazing thing it would be 
uh, if South Carolina were leading the way. I, I mean, I, I I think you're right on target on that, and and uh, it's an honor to to be endorsed uh, by Win the Air uh, with uh, with my dear friend Jamie. Let me ask you a, a personal question. You went from this national campaign, you know, you know, jet setting uh, all over the all over the all over the country, uh, you know, in rural parts of, of Iowa to rural parts of South Carolina and everywhere in between. Uh, really quickly, because we got to get the Q and A with Belinda. What was how was the transition from that to now quarantine? Uh, it is a, a <laughs> uh, it is a shift. I'll tell you. I mean, coming off presidential campaign is a shift uh, to begin with, and uh, um, uh, and that's true for everybody who's part of it. And I'm excited that Belinda is part of this program after her uh, fantastic work as part of our team because we had the most amazing, uh, amazing group of people, and everybody I think was it was uh, uh, in that transition that happens whenever you step off the campaign. For me. Uh, it was, uh, you know, we were going three states, four states a day sometimes. Uh, there were, we started celebrating just if I would have two nights in the same hotel room, never mind a night at home, just feeling like I was at home because I didn't have to pack up my toothbrush for one day. It felt like a, a bit of a, a bit of normalcy. So to go from that to this uh, is so dramatic to, to go to uh, being at home all the time. Um, but it's had a lot of virtues. We're counting our blessings. We're healthy. Uh, uh, Chastin and I have never spent this much time together. Uh, we are uh, dining together, we're cooking together. It's a pretty good roast. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to uh, smell it's, it's making its way upstairs here to where I'm sitting. Uh, and uh, the dogs are definitely happy to have us home. I'm not sure they're going to handle it well when we uh, are able to get back out into the world. But uh, what I'll say is we're also learning how busy you can get without leaving the four walls of your home. Uh, because there's so much good work to do, and, and I'm so glad that uh, we found ways to do it remotely, even if it's not quite the same. I was looking forward to uh, some uh, some uh, uh, opportunities to, to come out your way uh, and, and enjoy campaigning together in person and enjoy a little South Carolina barbecue while we were at it. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, when the time comes, we'll make up for lost time. That's awesome. And so well, I know we're running a little short, <laughs> I mean, a little, little, little behind. So now without further ado, we're going to toss it to, to Belinda, and she's going to take it from here. Hey, everybody. My name is Belinda Wesley. I am the former South Carolina Constituency Director for Keep for America. So first thing, first and first, uh, first and foremost, um, thanks, J.A., for allowing me to be a part of this great effort and to join this prestigious panelist, including with my awesome former boss, Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Um, before we go ahead and go into this Q&A, we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping. Number one, make sure that if you do have a question that you raise your hand and we're going to go ahead and put you in the rotation to ask Mayor P or Representative J.A. Moore a question. And then the last um, housekeeping rule is during this fundraiser, we have three high donors that are willing to match our efforts up to $3,000. So for those who have already um, Donate it, like just like um, Mayor Benjamin said. Donate again. Your your money would not go to waste. Trust and believe that, and it would go to proper uses. So if so, make sure that you're donating during the fundraiser. So we go ahead and have those donors match our efforts. So the first question that we're going to go ahead and do is also my former colleague, uh, Walter Clyburn. Walter, please go ahead with your first question. All right. Oh. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Walter A. Clyburn Reed. Um, I was a former organizer uh, for Pete Buttigieg uh, during the uh, 2020 presidential primary. Um, and now I work for the South Carolina Coordinated Campaign, uh, which aims to help not only Jamie Harrison, but all down ballot candidates um, ensure a, to ensure a win. Um, especially here in South Carolina, because the goal of the coordinated campaign is to turn South Carolina blue. Um, and with that, I do have a question. I wrote down plenty. Um, let's see what we have here today. Um, so we are, um, of course, noticing <laughs> an inconsistency uh, between our Democratic governors and our Republican governors when it, in relation to a mass uh, mandate on a nationwide level. Uh, we know that this is the most obvious um, course of action as well as the most efficient uh, to stop the spread of COVID-19. 
Um, yesterday, the Surgeon General um, had some comments on the national mandate for masks. Um, and he said, and I quote, um, if we just try to mandate it, you have you you hate to have an enforcement mechanism, and we are in the mid we are in the midst of a moment when our policing has caused many different individuals to be killed for very minor offenses. Um, and I just wanted to get your uh, opinion on his statement um, in relation to uh, the community, uh, American communities, and law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, first of all, it's really, really great seeing you, and uh, I'm, I'm proud to see that you jump right back into it, and you're uh, uh, continuing to organize and work. So uh, I uh, say hi to all the friends that we made together on some of the HBCU campuses and other places you were organizing with us, and uh, uh, thanks for all the great work that you did. Belinda, same uh, 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 with you. I'm, I'm glad to be reunited. And, uh, thanks again for the terrific job that, uh, uh, that you did on our campaign. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's a uh, a good example, Walter, of how much confusion has come out of the White House. You know, we need to hear with one clear voice uh, where mayors, leaders like Mayor Benjamin um, and governors and the White House are all uh, leading us in the same direction. Otherwise, we're going to continue to see confusion. And I think that was a confused and a confusing answer to try to invoke the fact that there has been uh, a clearly disparate impact because of police violence, uh, especially harming black communities to try to use that as an excuse uh, to say that we're not gonna uh, push mask wearing when we also know uh, that it is uh, black communities in particular that have suffered the greatest harm uh, in terms of being more likely to contract COVID-19, especially because the uh, essential workers who were treated as disposable workers and are now being told they're essential when it comes to being uh, uh, told to go back to work, not always essential when it comes to how they're being paid. Uh, but right. those are workers who are disproportionately black and brown. And after uh, getting the virus, more likely uh, to suffer the worst consequences of it because of systemic issues, like the kinds of health equity issues we talked about in the context of the Douglas plan, uh, like the, uh, uh, the lack of health insurance and access to care, uh, we've been on down the list. Uh, so we cannot allow the suffering that, that we know needs to be fixed when it comes to policing in America to be used as an excuse to do nothing at all, even a national guideline. Uh, right. that could be stronger than what we're getting. Um, and uh, yeah, states can, can work out enforcement mechanisms. We're not talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, this, is, this is not gonna be a question of, uh, of, of coercion. This is a question of common sense. Right. Uh, and if there, anything I think uh, uh, makes me worried about uh, intimidation and coercion when it comes to mask wearing, it's the way certain uh, uh, people almost always in Florida for some reason, and I know they don't represent most of Florida, uh, but certain yeah. people show up on the interview with a terrifying level of aggression when they're asked to do something as simple as protect themselves and those around them by wearing a mask. Right. You are correct. Um, I, I, am I allowed to ask another question or would that be breaking the rules? I don't want to Go ahead, go ahead, Walter. One, one more. <laughs> <laughs> Walter raised a second question. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Um, ha. Being from uh, South Carolina, uh, we are one of many states who are the most affected by COVID. Number one is Arizona. Number two, um, I believe, is Florida, and I believe number three is us. Um. Seeing as we're the most affected by COVID um, due to inaction by a certain governor, um, we are opening school soon. Um, and I just wanted to get um, your opinion on the precautions that we should take um, in terms of lowering the risk of, for America's youth. Well, I'm really worried about what's gonna happen in our schools, uh, not only to young people, but uh, also teachers. Uh, you know, you could uh, have a, a child who is five with a teacher who is 30 going home to uh, where there is a grandma who is uh, 60 or 70, everybody's connected. And uh, that's one of the reasons why the kinds of steps we've been talking about, um, the steps in terms of testing, in terms of tracing, things that Mayor Benjamin and others uh, have been working on uh, both locally and nationally. Uh, steps like making sure that people are wearing masks, that we uh, comply with distancing. Those weren't about shutting down the country. Those were about putting us in a position where it would be safe to open. We have not done the homework. We have not taken the steps that are needed 
in most communities to make it safe for us to open schools and just pushing people back out. Look, we've got to make sure that the kids are educated and we've got to make sure for especially low income kids where uh, this is uh, uh, not only education, but uh, something parents rely on for childcare, something families rely on for nutrition, for food. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to make sure that we don't leave these kids and families hanging, but that doesn't necessarily mean pushing them back in into an environment that isn't safe. And it certainly doesn't mean threatening the federal funds of those jurisdictions that are making the best decisions in the interests of their kids. And, and, and let me just say, uh, Walter, that's a great question. We, uh, I uh, worked uh, uh, just recently, we had a panel, I think it was last week, uh, where we talked to superintendents of uh, uh, here in Berkeley County of, of, you know, and teachers and parents about that very question. And there's a lot of people here in my district and across the state that have a lot of anxiety around uh, students going back into a physical classroom. And I share that concern, not only uh, just the, uh, uh, you know, just the initial concerns, but do, will we have enough PPEs uh, for, uh, for schools and will schools now start <laughs> competing with hospitals for PPEs? Uh, not, not to mention, uh, like Pete was mentioning, uh, there is a concern with child care, so we have to do stuff uh, at the state level to make sure that uh, we uh, infuse more money into the ABC voucher program and also uh, uh, tax uh, incentives, uh, tax breaks for essential workers for, for child care. Um, you know, personally, uh, I, I don't think, you know, uh, I don't think now is the right time for us to be focused on reopening uh, in-person schools. Right now, there's a lot of, you know, and, I, and I'll tell you, Berkeley County has been doing a great job of it, of, of the virtual e-learning. Uh, we need to uh, invest more resources into that uh, for broadband access throughout the state. Um, also, uh, the technology that is needed uh, to make sure it's done safely. But if you, um, and we need to also get more input from teachers. You know, my mom's been in education for 40 years and, and Pete, I know Chaston, he's a, he's a teacher. And so I know you, you get probably input from him all the time about it. You know, this is a very critical time and we got to get it right. You know, with our kids, I have a 10 month old daughter. She's a, actually 11 month old daughter now. Like we, we, we only get one chance to do what's right with our kids. And uh, I'm just very concerned. Uh, I want kids to go back to school. Like I said, my mom's an educator. And if I don't, and I think she's on this call, so if I don't iterate that, I'm gonna hear it later. Uh, but I want them to be safe. That's the number one priority. And I think because we did not follow proper protocol when it was needed, you know, I called for a requirement here in South Carolina to wear masks, and the governor uh, did not uh, listen. Um, I just don't think we, we can do it in good conscience. You know, I, I'm, I'm taking a stance on it. It's no way in good conscience by in a month we will be prepared for kids to safely go back to school. And I know you guys are talking high bribe policy right now, and I agree with everything said. I do want the record to reflect I just gave again to J.A. Moore. So the link is still alive and it's still going. So those of you who are here, remember, we're still raising money, talking to these very bright policymakers. We're still raising money. So keep on giving to Jay while we keep on talking. All right. Thank you, Steve. All right, beautiful people. Let's go ahead and go to our second person. We had Ms. Cheryl Monk. We're gonna go ahead and give you the floor and go ahead with your first and only question. Thank you. Hi, right, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hey, Pete, it's nice to see you again. I got to meet you in February. It was great. It was an honor. Oh, thank you. Um, Thanks is, for joining is us. Steve, is Steve Benjamin still on? Yes. Okay. Well, this is for all you guys. And then I have a second question for J.A. First, I would like to know everybody's opinion on what we can do to fight voter suppression. Mm. Well, I'll be concise, but I'd love to hear the mayor's take on this. Uh, I think the most important thing on the front end is that we have to identify uh, anywhere it's happening. And there are organizations like Fair Fight uh, that are doing this right now. Uh, and uh, if you're thinking to yourself, you know, I want to be helpful, but I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I'm not specially trained in election protection. Remember, you can also help just by volunteering to be a poll worker, something that my generation doesn't think about a whole lot. Uh, and we forget that in our country, 
elections are run uh, largely by volunteers, by retirees who sign up to do this. One of the most patriotic things you can do, and there are fewer people available to do it in the COVID era, uh, which is one of the reasons uh, why Milwaukee, for example, went from 175 polling places to five this year with, uh, uh, with real consequences for the ability in particular uh, of uh, a lot of marginalized communities to be able to get their vote in. So that's just one example uh, of the steps that, that each of us can take uh, in order to make sure that, uh, that the vote is, uh, is fair, that it's efficient, uh, that everybody has their voice heard. But I love a state-specific take from the mayor. Yeah, and I'd say as well, um, please get involved with the South Carolina Democratic Party's order protection efforts. Uh, there's a lot of good work going on. Um, it's amazing. <clears throat> Uh, what used to be just folks coming to the polls to try and intimidate you from voting has really turned into a, a, an incredibly um, sophisticated, uh, surgical, and shameless effort that now uses the tools of the state, as, as Pete just referenced, to try and stop people from voting. It's going to be that much more of a challenge this year because of the pandemic. Uh, we, we, we always relied a, a bit on, um, on absentee balloting or, or, or early voting. It was going to be kind of the core. Uh, of, of, of so many campaigns all across the country. So I would encourage you, get involved in this state, um, specifically uh, with the um, South Carolina Democratic Party's efforts. There's a whole lot of work going here and, and, and participation with Fair Fight as well, and the great work Stacey Abrams is doing all, all across the country right now. But get involved, uh, get involved early. There's a shortage of poll workers. If there's a possibility, I encourage you uh, to consider doing that as well. Yep, and, I, got, and, and, I got my South Carolina Democratic Party shirt on. I love it. And I will, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, and, and I'll just say real quick, my mom uh, is, in, is involved with the lawsuit uh, as far as for, um, for absentee ballot uh, for folks that are single or don't have anyone else living in the house and not needing that witness uh, piece. So, so you know, there's, there's lawsuits you can get involved with. And she was asked to be a plaintiff on that. So she's the lead plaintiff okay. on, on that part of the lawsuit. Yeah, I agree with that because I had to get my neighbor to witness my signature back in um, May, late May. And I was wearing a mask, but she wasn't. So, you <laughs> right. know, didn't like that too much. But uh, J.A., my uh, last question is, um, Let's see, I wrote it, I sent it to Jacob. He should remember. Um, what was it? Oh, I would like you to push the House to take on vote by mail for this November, especially. I know you probably already are. Yeah, and it's, and, and I tell you what, it, it was very discouraging because we, what we were trying to do when we were in session a couple of weeks ago is vote on it then. And yeah. unfortunately, you know, we, we, we are in a state where uh, Democrats aren't in the majority and the majority party, unfortunately, uh, uh, prefers less people to vote, if I'm just being honest. And yeah. they, their position was, well, we can wait and deal with it in September. And, you know, to, to the credit of, of our, my esteemed colleague, Justin Bamberg, he argued that why wait? You know, we, we know based on how things are trending, Things are going to get worse. We may not be able to come back in September safely, and we tried to deal with it then, but but uh, unfortunately, I can tell you why Columbia. they said wait till September. I know this game. Come September, it'll be oh, we ain't got time for that. Uh, I know this. But we'll, game. we'll. I'll tell you what. We'll keep fighting and advocating for for uh, you know for more, more vote by mail. But I will. What I will say is that there, you know, and I can't remember when it was. I think it was sometime last week. It was a big uh, court case that was won here in South Carolina, uh, and I think over a million dollars will be spent uh, for vote by mail to make sure that uh, people have the resources, not not just to get their absentee ballots, but the return, uh, the, re stamp. the return, the stamp, the return back. So, yeah. we, so that case, we just won that, I think that was last mm -hmm. week, am I right, Steve? That, that was really good. <laughs> I, I appreciated that. Yeah, because last week. Last week. That's mm -hmm. how tight my budget is. Is I think about things like, do I need an envelope? Do I have a stamp? So, right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, Cheryl. Bye, Pete. Bye, Steve.
Um, the next person we're going to go to is Ms. Jamie Garcia. And before we go ahead and go to Ms. Garcia, I want to please remind everybody that you are only allowed to one question. But we have a list of people who are going to be going to time and time. And there's women and what happened? I see it. Did we lose you? I think she's on now. Ms. Garcia, are you on? Ms. Garcia, all you have to do is unmute yourself and you're good to go. I am unmuted. Yes, ma'am. We got you. Go yeah. ahead. Okay, uh, please bear with me. I'm just about to get off my bus. I just got off work a little bit ago. <laughs> well, thank so, you for uh, juggling two things at once to be with us tonight. Well, I really didn't think my question would get picked, so I'm kind of giddy at the moment. Um, <laughs> Pete, my question is, well, the article you wrote uh, that I read earlier today that you co-authored, it just really proved that you really have your finger on the pulse of the international challenges that we face. So would you accept the position of Secretary of State if offered by Vice President Biden and Mr. Trump's president? Well, thank you for, for such a flattering question. I think you uh, you may be mentioning an article that uh, I co-authored that uh, uh, with Ambassador Philip Gordon that appeared today in Foreign Policy. It was about how important it is that we rebuild the alliances and the relationships that make America strong and, and why uh, we're in such trouble. And uh, uh, so uh, I appreciate you taking the time to read it. I uh, hope you uh, found it found it useful. Um, and uh, yeah, yes, of course, I, I would be honored uh, to serve in any capacity in, uh, in, in a Biden administration. Um, but I also know that uh, uh, the most important thing for me to do, no matter what uh, my future is going to be, is to make sure that there is a Biden administration. That's important to me, uh, not just as, as somebody who, who uh, might participate and who will be supporting uh, the administration for sure, whether it's uh, from a job uh, role in government or in some other way, but just as an American citizen, it is uh, so important that we have uh, that change in leadership. So uh, that's my focus right now, but uh, I, I have been taking the opportunity to weigh in on a number of issues around foreign policy uh, that I think are, are uh, so pressing at a time like this. And uh, I'm, I'm so appreciative that you took the time to, uh, to read what I had to say. Thank you so much, Ms. Garcia. The next person we're going to go to is Marvin Pendarvis. Please go ahead with your question, please. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Representative Moore, Mayor Pete, Mayor Benjamin. It's a pleasure uh, to be on, and, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, my name is Marvin Pendarvis, Mayor Pete. We've met briefly before on the campaign trail. Um, I serve in the, the legislature with uh, Representative Moore. And so I am a big supporter. Representative, I want you to know that um, I will be donating and I will make sure uh, that I spread the word because we need you back in Columbia. What you're doing is important. Um, but I do have a question, not to belabor the point. Um, Mayor Pete, uh, one of the things, and, and, and Jay A can attest to this, is um, with the coronavirus going on, and the CARES Act and, and so much of the conversation about how the virus has impacted the economy and, and, and that things of that nature, in addition to the climate we're going into 2020, what do you think state legislatures could be doing to be most effective? I recognize we're in the minority here in South Carolina, uh, but I believe that uh, state legislatures serve an important role especially going into such an important election here in 2020. So uh, what kind of um, advice or <laughs> suggestions could you be giving to myself, Representative Moore, and so many of our colleagues here in South Carolina and across the country about things that we could be pushing towards? Well, thanks. First of all, thanks for, for what you're doing in, in the chamber. And, and thanks for uh, uh, your question, because I, I think it's, it's on point. Look, uh, uh, this is a moment that's showing us how much uh, offices besides the presidency really matter. And uh, just think about the things that are most at stake right now, right? Uh, we think about uh, elections. We're talking about voter suppression. Elections are largely managed at the state level. Yes, by Secretary of State, but state legislation plays a huge role in things like, uh, you know, it's not every state that actually has this requirement that you go get a witness, uh, for example, when you vote. Uh, Chaston and I did our vote from home and we didn't have to do that. Uh, Indiana's not exactly the most uh, voter friendly state, but but it shows you that it's different from state to state. You can uh, raise the alarm on that. We talk about policing, uh, you know, uh, frameworks for police accountability, 
uh, are mostly set at the state level. They define the powers that mayors have, that chiefs have, and that citizens have uh, when it comes to police oversight. When it comes to the expectation about how much training uh, is required of police officers and what needs to be in that training. Uh, we talk about education, almost all of that. I think much more than most Americans really think about. I mean, I'm very concerned about what goes on in Washington with Betsy DeVos, uh, but ultimately it's it's in uh, your state and the chamber that you serve in that these decisions are made and that the the, that the money moves, right? That, that uh, really decides who benefits. Uh, you talk about uh, workers in the face of uh, COVID-19. Earlier today, I was with union leaders from basically two kinds of workers that they uh, that they have, the ones who have lost work because they're in retail and they don't uh, have jobs anymore. And then the ones who are being compelled to work even when it isn't safe mm. in places like poultry processing plants. Um, mm -hmm. Those decisions are often made at the state level. The simple fact of Medicaid, I know that, that uh, you know, this uh, might sound pie in the sky in a deep red state. Uh, the people of Oklahoma in a ballot initiative overrode their own Republican legislators and governors and insisted by, by ballot initiative that Medicaid be expanded. This happened just wow. a few weeks ago. Wow. So even in a deep red state, people get it. Not all the elected officials get it, but people get it. And that means that even if you are in the minority, and I know how, uh, uh, how uh, frustrating that can be from being in a state like Indiana where there's a similar dynamic, it remains the case that you're in a position to, to shine a light, to draw attention to these issues. Uh, and I know you're in a position to make sure that the stories uh, that that uh, that uh, people in their everyday lives are sharing, and the leaders, local leaders like Mayor Benjamin, can can offer about what they're dealing with. You can bring those stories into the chamber. So I, I think there's uh, it's hard to think of a job more more critical, uh, more important right now than that of state legislature. I know it's not as sexy, uh, and uh, 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 certainly not as lucrative, uh, and uh, uh, not always as glamorous. But I think it is as powerful. And meaningful as any job in government right now. And I'm, I'm so thankful that you continue to step forward to do it and support colleagues of yours like J.A. Well, thank you for the response, Mary. And, and, and I appreciate <laughs> your support of my dear friend and colleague, Representative Moore. And I look forward to, to showing you that barbecue once you make your way down to Charleston. <laughs> Sounds good. Take thank care, you, Rep. Rep. Yeah, thanks, brother. Thank you so much, Representative Pendarvis. Um, just a quick reminder, people, make sure that you're, you are donating to Representative J.A. Moore during while we're having this fundraiser. We have three donors that are willing to match our efforts up to $3,000, and I just went ahead and donated myself. So make sure that you're able to just go ahead and donate while we are fundraising. Let's go ahead and go to our next person. And please yeah. remember only one question to go to our next it's person. Me. And Ms. Carissa O'Neill, go ahead when you're ready for your first question. I'd like to know what we can do to support you, J.A., besides money, which I've given Mr. Mayor during this call, <laughs> um, as a win the air person, um, in addition to helping you fundraise. Well, that, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> um, uh, money is a part of it, but, but bigger than that, um, you know, what we're going to need in, in this election is uh, uh, innovative ways to connect with people. So obviously social media is going to play a, a great part. So making sure you go to J.A. Moore for SC15 on, uh, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I don't have a Snapchat yet, uh, but, but, but doing that. And then also there's going to be opportunities to do phone banking. Uh, and, and, and there is going to also be a need uh, for those of you that have certain expertise um, in certain areas, uh, you know, maybe healthcare expertise or education expertise or, or infrastructure expertise, sharing that with the campaign. So you, you can reach out to my comms director, uh, at Jacob at J A Moore for SC, he probably said no. We got a bunch of emails now, but but he'll be a, a good person to reach out to. A William at J A Moore for SC. That's my campaign manager. Shout out to William Pugh, who is a huge supporter of yours, Pete, uh, in at Howard University. Um, but uh, but it's it's important that we uh, that we do that. Um, but those are just a few ways you can help out. And let me just add, uh, uh, you know, we have a chance by engaging a national network 
uh, that, that you're a part of that has so much power because of uh, all of the relationships that we built on the campaign to send that message about how important these uh, these races are, including non-federal races. Uh, and so uh, uh, I'll echo, you know, just amplifying what uh, Representative Moore and others are up to through your own social media presence, making sure that uh, uh, friends know that uh, uh, South Carolina has some very exciting races going on and some very important work, uh, even if it's not always considered a swing state or in the spotlight. Uh, and making sure more than anything that we're supporting each other in the work that we're doing. All of that, as well as your generous uh, financial contributions, make a big difference. And they make me proud uh, of this Women's Era community that we're all part of. Thank you so much, Mayor Pete. Um, we're going to go to our last and our final Q&A person. I would like to go ahead and reach out to Ms. Amy Hayes. Go ahead with your question. And this is our last question. Go ahead, Ms. Hayes. Hi, Pete. Good to see you. Hi. Um, <laughs> Amy and Rockhill, I'm hiding up like in the attic so that the child doesn't <laughs> interrupt us. Um, but I, I have two questions I was thinking about asking, real wonky, and one is kind of more on the spiritual level, I would say. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to go with the latter, and that's just um, what what did you learn from South Carolina? What is the lesson of South Carolina politics? Um, and do you think that that's a lesson that could help America right now? Um, hmm. And I'd also like to hear Representative Moore answer that question. Yeah, um, so many things that I learned and, and I'm still learning from, from South Carolina. Uh, the first is that you never know where you're going to uh, be able to earn support uh, from uh, uh, being humbled to have uh, Representative Moore's support uh, to finding people willing to uh, work so hard. The, 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 the staff members who are on the call here uh, and volunteers, who uh, uh, some of whom uh, just found us before we even had uh, the resources to put a campaign organization in on the ground. Uh, so that was one. Um, another is that relationships uh, are something you build over a lifetime. And so uh, I'm looking forward to uh, keeping up uh, relationships and building uh, on relationships with uh, our friends in South Carolina and people I'm, I'm, I'm just now getting to know. The third is that your assumptions are not always uh, right. And I'll give you just a simple example. Um, usually in political uh, media commentary, when people talk about rural America, it, it's kind of assumed that you're talking about white America. Uh, whereas we saw again and again that uh, when we were in, uh, especially some of the hardest hit low income uh, rural places in South Carolina, uh, this was also a question of racial justice. Uh, and there were so many black families, uh, Latinx families uh, in uh, rural parts of South Carolina who uh, really exemplified the need to, to get uh, everything from internet access to, to decent education and basic infrastructure uh, there. Um, I saw an amazing tradition of political involvement and neighborhood involvement that, uh, that is really unique, I think, in, in South Carolina communities. Uh, and uh, enormous inequality, uh, right, uh, kind of right in front of you as, as you navigate it, sometimes just a few blocks within the same community. Uh, and the last thing I would say is just the sophistication that people sometimes with not a lot of resources bring to the challenges in front of them. I think of the health equity conversation that we had in a, uh, in a small business, a grocery store uh, in Charleston. Uh, I think about uh, uh, our visit to Allendale County, I think uh, the poorest county in, in South Carolina, or one of them where uh, people spoke with, with such a, a deep uh, reserve of, of, of insight about uh, their lived experience. Um, there really was no experience like campaigning in South Carolina, and I'm, uh, I'm enjoying the chance to be campaigning in South Carolina in a different way right now uh, and, and on into the future. Uh, Amy, I, uh, you know, th that was, I mean, that question gave me chills. Uh, and, and I think Pete uh, articulated it very well. Um, I, you know, I would just say uh, living here in South Carolina, you know, you know for the past, <laughs> 35 years to so all of my life uh, and having the opportunity, uh, especially uh, this election cycle to, to travel um, uh, across the country and, and you know, on a, you know, helping now uh, presidentially. Um, I echo what, what Pete say, you know, you, you, you see just uh, people here in South Carolina who have so little, but are so grateful, uh, and are so uh, creative in the way in which they're able to, to not just survive their conditions, but thrive in a lot of ways. Um, I'll give you an example. I have a, 
a, a lady who, you know, I'm originally <laughs> from a little town called Hampton, South Carolina, which is right the next county over from Allendale that that uh, Pete just mentioned. And Miss James lived on the top of my road growing up. Miss James just celebrated her 100 years of life earlier this year. And so Miss James has experienced uh, so much being an African-American woman that's lived 100 years in South Carolina. Uh, she's experienced everything from uh, being spit upon and called uh, out of her name uh, to being able to witness the first African-American president uh, to, you know, we were able to honor her at the State House earlier this year uh, for her birthday. Um, Ms. Ms. James, to me, uh, in so many ways, just represents um, the pain of South Carolina and also the promise. And, uh, and so I, I think the lesson for this country is, for South, that South Carolina can help teach is that, um, and I think it, it, it's in our, our kind of model, while I breathe, I hope, and, and what I take from that is that uh, there's so, much, so many challenges that, that we face as, as a state uh, a lack of leadership. Uh, we've had a generation uh, now here in South, uh, now here in South Carolina that has not invested in infrastructure, has not invested in education, has not invested in working people, has not invested in clean drinking water or air that we breathe. But still, <clears throat> somehow, we're so hopeful as a people here in South Carolina. Uh, and I'm just excited to play a very small role in that change that needs to happen in South Carolina. Uh, but I, I'm just I'm just truly grateful for for brothers like uh, Steve and Pete uh, for fighting this good fight with us. And, and I'm just excited. And, and I think and I got to say this, even though this is my fundraiser, we got to do everything we can for Jamie Harrison to be our next senator. We have to do it. It's up to all yep. of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Hayes. So that is all we have um, this evening for the fundraiser people. But I urge you again to make sure that you're donating. The link is in the <coughs> bio. It's make sure you click the link and you donate while we are still within our fundraising time. So we that our donors match our efforts. So it's been a pleasure being your moderator. I want to go ahead and toss it back to my former boss, my awesome bo former boss, Mayor Pete Buddha Judge, with his closing remarks. Great, uh, great job, Linda. Thanks for uh, uh, guiding our conversation. And, and uh, uh, thanks to everybody who was part of this. Wonderful to see so many uh, friends and uh, familiar faces and new ones, too. Uh, thanks to everybody in the community for stepping up to join us. I'm honored to be with uh, Mayor Benjamin, as always. I'm sure I'll uh, see you in the next day or two in the Zumo sphere on some other shared cause, because uh, uh, thankfully we, uh, we, we continue to uh, team up in many ways. And uh, uh, Jay, we, we are here for you and we are proud of you. I think everybody, if, if you were uh, new to Representative Moore's campaign, when you joined this call, hopefully you, you understand why uh, I was uh, proud to have his support uh, when I was running and why it's so important to me that we be here to support him right now. These are the moments that we're going to look back on and remember 2020 and what we were doing. And it's not just because of the uh, epic importance of getting the White House back into the right hands. Uh, it's really about making sure that uh, leadership at the state and local level meets the moment. And this is a moment that will require more imagination and compassion and capacity uh, than anything we've seen in, in our lifetimes. So that's why we're here. And I know that everybody here understands that. Uh, Representative, I'm proud to be in your corner. We're gonna be proud to uh, celebrate your uh, return to Columbia and the work that uh, you're gonna do in the months and years ahead. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, uh, do do I do, do Belen? Do I give a closing remark, or, or, or we are we all set? So why don't you take us out? <laughs> oh, well, that was wonderful. I feel like that's it, but uh, <laughs> I'd love that. Uh, but but in all sincerely, uh, um, I, I was just just over here, just like reflecting on, um, you know, it's it's been a year, you know, a little over a year since uh, I had the pleasure of first speaking to you, Pete. And um, and I just really do appreciate your leadership. And um, I'd be remiss to, to not mention how I just I'm just thinking about uh, Victoria and I, I and our future and our daughter's future, Mariah Ray Love Moore. 
And uh, it's just so important that we get this right this time, y'all. Obviously, it's important. My, my election is important, but we have to do everything we can to see this moment. I've been telling folks uh, for probably about two years now, I believe that we're in our 1964 moment um, for our generation. And we can we can do one or two things in this moment because from 1964 to 1968, we had a lot of progress. But those that are students of history will remember the almost dramatic shift of 1968, how all of that promise that, that was done in the 60s almost um, at once was not yet realized. And so uh, this generation of leaders, we have to make sure that uh, the pendulum swings for good and that we don't miss our moment and realize that the marching, the protesting, uh, the, the, the shouts and demand for justice is, is one part of, but it's not all parts of it. We need folks uh, to run for office. We need folks to hold those of us that are in uh, elected positions accountable. We need people on the outside advocating and, uh, and, and agitating with us. Um, this is a moment, you know, this is our 1964 moment and we have to make sure that we get it right this time. It's so vitally important and I'm encouraged. I really, truly, truly am encouraged by just the, uh, the light-mindedness of so many brilliant people. And, and I'm just grateful for everybody. Thank y'all so much from those of you all over the, the country, especially for my peeps here in South Carolina. Thank y'all so much and, and, and God bless. Thank y'all. God bless. Thank you. Keep it up. Take care, Thanks, brother. Everyone. Take care.